Hey, welcome to The Conversation. I'm Andy Mason, and this is Authentic Conversations around the messy intersection of faith, family, and business. And I've got a special guest with me today. His name is Mike Thacker. Mike, great to have you with us. Good to be here. And the title of this is The Messy Intersection of Faith, Family, and Business, because that's what Mike's journey is. <laughs> so if you're listening through this, you love Jesus, you love business, and you're entrepreneurial in nature, and you're wondering why does it not go easier, smoother than any of this, then this is going to really encourage you. And I'm just going to jump us straight into this is Mike's book. It's called Mike Drop. Uh, great book. I encourage you to get it if you want to do business God's way, live like a king and change the world. But I'm just going to read you. If you've never heard of Bob Goff, you need to look up that as well. But here's what Bob Goff wrote the forward. And here's what he says in the forward. Bob Goff says, my passion is helping people live better lives. It's how I'm also wired. And when I connect with other kindred spirits who also love the challenge of creating amazing, something amazing for people, I tend to jump in. Mike Thacker and I first met at the Oaks Retreat in Southern California. It was during a retreat, but I saw little backing away in Mike's heart for serving God or other people. I believe it's the same love that inspired him to write Mic Drop. Mike and I connected over our common background of walking away from the safe and structured in exchange for exploring the new and uncharted. Choosing the meaningful paths in life is a challenging yet worthy effort. Uh, Mike, is that true? That describes you? Uh, yeah, I mean, Bob, Bob probably described me better than I described myself. So I'll, uh, I'll go with what Bob said. <laughs> and I know we were just chatting about this is you know, how we first met. Uh, Mike would, had just written the book. He reached out. He saw us with Heaven and Business Online. And just so you know, we get a bunch of these saying, hey, you should have me on your podcast or I should be a speaker at your conference. I'm really awesome. Mike reached out. And initially I thought, oh, it's another one of those. And then I read more and I looked him up and looked up the book and I'm like, no, this, this is real deal. This is, he's actually doing this stuff, living it and led to a conversation as led to now meeting multiple times. And Mike, it's a pleasure having you on this episode. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. You know, so real special. So thank you. So here's what we want to cover is obviously we've got a book coming out. Listen up here and got at work. Yeah. Uh, it's going to equip people to, just grow in clarity and confidence, integrating God's voice into their daily activities and decisions. So we're going to touch base on how Mike has learned to hear the voice of God, what that looks like in his business, some of his story of where he's come from, where he's at right now. And then if if you haven't heard, this crazy guy and his wife bid on a burning house in Franklin, Tennessee, that they're on, uh, we believe, the last legs of actually getting that to sale. So we're going to hear about that. Why would anyone do that? And where's God in all of this? It's going to be a fun conversation. So Mike, tell us a little bit, just a snapshot of where you're from, because your accent's kind of unusual. And uh, and how did you get to be in Franklin, Tennessee? Uh, originally from the UK. So I was, uh, was born in the South and then lived in Manchester most of my life growing up. And uh, my wife and I got married when we were young. So we uh, went to Bible college, thought we were going to serve God in ministry. Uh, didn't quite work out that way and um, went into business. So uh, in the UK, I worked for uh, a large IT uh, specialist over the years. I got promoted a few times. And by the time I finished there, I ran the sales teams that sold to uh, local and national government. So we were um, the largest teams by volume and revenue. And I was 28, 29, feeling pretty pretty um, cocky with life, I guess. And then we um, we moved to America. We came here. I've been here a couple of times, actually. We came for a couple of years, went back, and then we came um, for good in Houston, Texas. So we uh, worked out there at some churches for a few years. Um, once again, realized that that probably wasn't the best fit for me. And so went back into uh, the marketplace. I was uh, chief operating officer at the Secret Service for Billionaires for five years. So that was fun. And then I opened uh, Houston's oldest and longest running co-working space back in 2015. So shout out for Work Lodge there. If you're in Houston, come check us out. Come come work for one of my spaces. It's nice to see people and make friends. But uh, we've been doing that for a while. And, uh, you know, one day woke up and thought, what if what if we tried somewhere different? You know, life's an adventure, right? So um, 
we'd, uh, we'd spent a little bit of time in Nashville in our college years. We actually interned at a program called Teen Challenge, which okay. is a substance rehabilitation program. And we loved it, had, had a blast. And so we were back in Nashville. Actually, we were a thing with Bob and uh, we were here for a few days and thought, you know, it's, it's nice out here. Like maybe we'll give it a go. So we prayed about it and pushed on the door a little bit, came for a couple more trips. And, um, and then we were here, we were here with the kiddos. Um, it was kind of the final, are we going to do this or not trip? And so we'd scheduled to look at some houses and stuff. And the day before we flew, this house came on the market that, um, that had burned down. So Linda sends me a text at like six in the morning and says, Hey, what do you think? I wrote back and said, well, go into the listing. We can, we can save the patio. So <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, I sent it to my realtor and I said, Hey, why don't you add this to the list? We'll go check it out. And so we, we got here Thursday, looked at some stuff. It was all terrible. And then Friday we were supposed to be looking around this side of town. And, and this, this house was, was one of the ones we were looking at. It was going to be the end of the day, but Thursday afternoon, I guess, I guess somebody online got excited and the thing just went viral. And I think it got like three or 400,000 views on Zillow gone wild and like one afternoon. So I, I pinged him that night and said, Hey, probably need to go look at that first, not last on the day. And by the time we got here Friday morning, they'd already had like a bunch of offers on it. Some guy was flying in from out of state. I was thinking we were going to get a deal, you know, maybe, maybe just snag a bargain, but that was not the case at all. And the price was going up, not down. So that was even worse, but um, we looked at it. We liked it. Had a meeting out there on the driveway with the kids. And said, what do you think? You want, you want a little adventure or not? And everybody said yes. They all deny it now that all the work had to be done. But uh, in the moment, they all said yes. In the moment. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we cut a deal right there and then. Signed about 30 minutes later on the paperwork. And uh, four weeks later, it was ours. And we started demo, yeah. So that was... So there's a bunch of things we're going to come back to. Secret service for billionaires. I mean, yeah. anybody that heard that is going to say, I want to know more. Co-working space, we'll come back to that. But let's park on this house. Okay. So you're an entrepreneur in everything. You love adventure, change. Uh, you brought your family from backwards and forwards, England, USA, Houston, Franklin, multiple different jobs. One of the things you said, which we'll also come back to is, you know, I just wasn't a fit for ministry. I thought it was ministry, but it just didn't, it wasn't the right fit for me. We'll come back to that as well. Right. But you're on the house. So let's talk about the house. Okay. So you buy this house. Have you ever done anything like this? And I'm sure it's public what it actually sold for. It, it like, have you ever, ever done anything like that with that level of risk? You're buying a house that, are you serious? The only thing recoverable was the porch? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a funny one. So when we came and looked at it, I just felt like it wasn't that bad. And I know that sounds great. You can go see it. It's on YouTube. Like we've vlogged the whole thing. So it's all there. And I mean, it, it was bad, but standing there in the moment, I just didn't think it looked that bad. <laughs> and I kind of just had a feeling that, you know, we could save some of it. Uh, I mean, there was no roof. It was all collapsed. You know, that a third of the house was just gone from the fire. Um, the, in fact, the room I'm sitting in is where the fire started. So this is, everything's brand new, like everything. It just wasn't there. But, um, you know, I can't say it was a God thing. I don't know that it wasn't a God thing. I just felt like, I think we could, I think we could do something with it. Yeah. Um, you know, this part of Nashville's, you know, pretty high price. So, you know, just land alone costs a lot anyway. Yeah. Um, there was a guest house on the property. So we just figured, well, we can stay in the guest house and then that saves us a little bit of money from having to rent something for a year and all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah, no, I just kind of felt a little bit bullish on it. And it's strange because, during closing and even after closing, um, everybody kept telling us to pull it down. I mean, we had two structural engineers that came out, I had multiple construction companies that came out, and they all said, knock it down, start again from scratch. And we just didn't, we just didn't feel like that was the right thing to do. You know, I wish I could be all spiritual and say, I wanted to do the godly thing and resurrect something and, you know, and, and salvage it. Cause obviously that's what God does with us, but yeah. I'm not, I'm not that spiritual. I mean, I just, it just felt like, why don't we see if we can just bring this thing back to life rather than just start from scratch? And so and you'll see on the videos, I think we were three or four videos in before we even found a structural engineer um, that actually said, okay, no, I think you could rebuild this. I'll, I'll sign off on, and I'll, you know, stay on because we had to have him on file. They had to come out a bunch of times, okay. like through the process, make sure everything yeah. was done. Okay. But I mean, I was sweating buckets by the end. Um, 
I was starting to wonder whether we just got it wrong and this sucker was going to come down. And if it, if we'd have had to pull the whole thing down, I mean, we'd have been up the creek, you know, without a paddle at that point. I mean, yeah, we did cost. not have the, you know, the capability to, to completely start from scratch. So, yeah. So I mean, you said a couple of things that intrigued me. One, it's almost like you're, you're either blind to it or you've just got this entrepreneurial belief of saying we could save this. Uh, or you said again, I think we could do something with this. Then I tie back to you work for Teen Challenge, which yeah. is it works for teenagers that have made bad choices. Yeah. And you're like, no, your wife and you, you loved it. Mm -hmm. it what's, we did. Is, is that a similarity? Is that a theme through Mike and Linda's life of I think we could do this. I think we could save this, save these people, turn these lives around, turn this burned down, broken thing. You said yeah, I'm not saying it's a God thing, but I wonder if it is, Mike. Is this a theme of your life? Yeah, I mean, I think as you get older, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Um, you start to get a little bit more analytical as you can look back and you can look at history. Certainly going through life, I don't know that I w would ever have described it that way or if I ever felt like it was that way, you know, um, that it was some intentional wisdom in Mike to say, hey, we can always, you know, turn something around. But, but no, you're right. I think there's a pattern there that says, whether it's people, whether it's, you know, a house, whether it's, whether it's something else that I think that heart of God is, Hey, you know, can we take something and make it new again? Like, can we yeah. take something and make it better? Can we take something and help it along the way and just be a part of its journey? And, um, I mean, there's definitely been that theme, you know, over the years. So yeah, I mean, it seems like it would, I mean, I was, a, I was a youth pastor. I was a kid's pastor, you know, we planted a church. So, you know, even in, in those kind of situations, it's, you know, it's that same kind of thought I think that comes through just in how you, you know, you value people and see them, um, you know, and everyone's different in that, but. Yeah, that's so that's cool. That's, I mean, I love that theme. And and like you say, that ties into this redemptive nature of who God is. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of this, you said ministry wasn't for you. <laughs> I mean, you're now in a multi-million dollar building project. I'm sure if, depends if it extends much longer, you might say, yeah, this is not for me either. Or maybe you've already come to the end of that. Uh, is it working? Yeah, I think it is. Um, certainly in the last few years, uh, when we created the, the co-working business, you know, my wife and I sat down and said, okay, the church thing isn't, isn't what we're cut out for at all, but, but we've got a heart that wants to do something for Jesus, right? Like yeah. we still want to help people. And I think what I, what I wish I would have had more of in life and I, what I think was lacking certainly in the UK, but even here, um, the general, the general message seems to be, oh, you feel like, you know, you've got a call of God on your life, or you feel like God wants you to do something, come serve in the church. Yeah. Like be a volunteer, be a paid staff member, like whatever, be a pastor. And there was no voice that said, hey, you know what? Actually, you'll have more impact for the kingdom if you go into the marketplace. Yeah. N never did anybody say that to me. I can remember being at Bible college, um, and, and, and even, you know, and even beyond. And I think, I think that's a shame. And I think it's something we need to fix. It's why I wrote the book. Yep. It's why we, you know, became friends because some, someone needs to tell folks who have a heart that is sensitive to kingdom things. And I mean this respectfully, the worst thing you can do is go work in a church. Yeah. Like, and, and I agree. Not, yeah. We're not here to babysit Christians. We're here to go, to go and impact the world. Right. Like, People need to hear about Jesus. They need to see his love. We need to be real. And and the, the beauty of business and entrepreneurship is, you know, we're the kings, right? Of our own little kingdoms. And and that concept from the Old Testament's there. You know, I write about it. I talk about it. That's how you get the ability to do things. Because when we created this, this business, this co-working business, we said, okay, we're going to, we'll create a 501c3 before we even open the doors. And then we'll just fund it. We'll just fund it from the business, right? I don't need to, I don't need a, a vote. I don't need to ask anybody. I don't need a committee. We'll just fund it and then we can go do whatever we want. And so we've done some really fun things. I mean, we built some children's homes overseas, a bunch of water wells, helped Bob on some stuff out in Africa. I think we're going to do something else out there as well that we're working on. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch of other stuff. I think we've got a feeding program still in Houston. We give away about a million dollars a year of food to families in need. And we've been doing that for 10 plus years now. Um, I'm a big believer in practical Yep. because I don't think Jesus was kidding in Matthew 25. Yeah. You know, when he was talking about the folks who had water to drink and food to eat and that kind of stuff, I didn't notice him saying anything about how long they spent in prayer. And I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. Obviously we should, 
but that wasn't that wasn't the mechanism they were being judged by. Yeah. They were being judged by how they treated other people, how they loved on him, when they were in a position of being able to do something to help them. And so to me, that says, well, my calling is I've got to put myself in a position where I can help some folks. Yes. So that means I got to push myself and not be lazy. You know, I used to joke I'd retire at 50 and you know, here I am at 50 and I'm not retired. And I don't think I don't think I will be, but some days I feel like it. But I know, I know that's not right. That's not God didn't put me on the earth to just just exist for Mike and take care of me. Um, so you know, the responsibility is push yourself, and then the second responsibility is once you've done that, are you going to live it out? You know, and I talk about this as well in the book. Yeah, um, it sounds easy, right? Some people will listen, and they'll say, "Oh, but you know what? You 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 know, you've made some money, and look, we're not that wealthy. Like you, some people think we are, but we're not. Um, but but I recognize we're doing better than some folks, obviously." You know, we wouldn't be buying a house like this if if we weren't. But it's so easy to think, man, it, when I make more money, I'll do more for Jesus. You know, when I've got more, I can give more. Like, it sounds so great. You hear these songs, oh, bless me so that I can be a blessing. It's like, you know what? If you won't be a blessing now, you won't yeah. be a blessing when you have more. If yeah. you If you don't learn, and it's not even about giving, you know, money. Honestly, I despise the fact that we just talk about money so much. I, I, I think... Sometimes I wonder if God just finds money just distasteful to talk about because <laughs> he owns everything, right? The cattle yeah. on a thousand hills, like it's all his. And we sit here, you know, just sweating over a piece of paper with a number on it and some, you know, some shiny pieces of metal. And I get that it makes the world go around and all that other kind of stuff, but we're so focused on that. We, we miss the heart stuff and the deeper stuff. And even if you haven't got anything, even if you're not doing well, you know, we started a business and we were investing into our nonprofit before we invested into Mike and Linda. Yeah. Um, you know, we went a year, a year and a half or something without a paycheck for us. But by that point, the business was stable. It was healthy. And we were giving into our kingdom fund through our nonprofit because apparently I've, I've, I've lived this way of thinking Jesus should do better out of Mike than Mike does. And, you know, there's not a hard number there. Yeah. And um, it's a little bit kind of, nuanced but i can tell you this the more zeros you add to a check the harder it gets no matter how much you got so going from 50 bucks to 500 going from 500 bucks to 5000 going from 5000 to 50000 going from 50000 to 500000 you think well but oh dude you're making all this money so it's super easy to write a check for that no it's not yeah because you still sit there and you think $50,000 would buy me a truck like I could have a real nice vacation. I could probably go around the world with with Linda for like six months or something, you know? And instead I want to go build a children's home. I think it was like 60 grand to build a children's home, you know? But but we chose to do the children's home because because that's what we felt like God was nudging. And this is a long answer to your question, I know, but I just think it's important to point out, you know, if you're early in your business cycle, or if you're late in your business cycle, that thought that says it will get easier is a lie. Yeah. That thought that says when I have more, it'll be easier for me to do more is also a lie. It will yeah. never be easier. It only gets harder. And yeah. so I would encourage you to think through that for yourself and make those changes now and reshape yourselves now because like we're greedy people. Like we are. I've gotten greedier as I've gotten older. Like I see it in myself and I don't like it. Um, I don't want to be. But when I was younger, things that would never have bothered me, now it's like, I just sense that pause for a second. It's like, Mike, what are you doing? You know, you've done this 10 times before, 50 times before, like, stop. It's not about you. It's about him. And yeah. um, maybe that's just me, but I, I don't, I don't know that it is. No, I mean, this is, this is a similar conversation that we're having. Just highlight this. The book is called Mike Drop. Mike, they can get it on Amazon. They can get it on your website as well. Um, I think we just sell it on Amazon. I don't even think I sell it. Like I didn't write it to sell books. I just wanted to get the story out and, you know, and, and make friends with some folks that love Jesus. So it yeah. was working. I mean, grab a copy of the book. It'll inspire you. It'll challenge you. And I just love that part. Why wait? Do it now. Yeah. Um, that would be the conversation we have with a lot of people, especially when I get to, if you catch yourself saying, yeah. when I make this money, when I have this settled, when the kids go to school, when the, whatever yeah. it is, stop. And ask yourself, is that just a human wisdom or is that God? And and I love it. The challenge is, it's, if you're going to live this life fully engaged with what God's purposes are for you, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah, It's going to be awkward. It's going to get you outside of your comfort zone, which means it feels unsafe. 
But on the other side of it, 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 the rewards are incredible. Mike, talk to me if I'm like this and I think, okay, I'm listening. How do I know or how do you know what to step into? Okay, ministry is not working. What do I step into? Oh, um, I'm doing this. I'm sitting in a role in my workplace. And if I just wait out another 15 years, I'm going to hit retirement. And then I can do half-life, the second half-life. Yeah. No, no, don't wait. So yeah. what would you suggest or how would you how would you discover what to step into? Yeah, so we wrestle with this, right? So, um, you know, let's rewind to like 2010. So we came back to America. I had two kids when we came back. We had a third child here. We were working at a church. Um, I think we were probably making a couple thousand bucks over the poverty level. <laughs> and so, you know, it got to the point one day where we, um, we had a small mortgage on a house and I couldn't pay the mortgage, right? And so I had to borrow money to pay the mortgage, oh, which no. for, me, for me was a challenge. Um, you know, in the UK, I mean, I mentioned it, you know, I was in my 20s. The company I worked for was an $8 billion company. My yeah. sales team sold $100 million a year at the time or thereabouts, maybe 95. Um, like we did okay. And so for me, you know, that was the moment where I sat down and said, okay, this doesn't feel like this makes sense. You know, I'm trying to do this stuff for, for the kingdom and I can't provide for my family and we're getting food stamps. I'm riding a $99 bicycle to work that I got from Walmart in Texas in July. I mean, I like the heat, but it's a little toasty, you yeah. know, and, and we did this for a while. <laughs> um, we woke up one day and said, look, this doesn't make a lot of what sense. I went and got a second job. Um, I started doing some web stuff because I used to own a web company in England back in the day. So I was working, I was working five days at the church. I was working three days at the Apple store. And then I was doing web stuff as well on the side to try and figure out what do we do here? And one day I heard this message and uh, it was a podcast I think I was listening to. And it was, um, it was a Bethel guy. I always, I always say it was Chris Vallotton, but I don't think it was Chris Vallotton. So I'm sorry, Chris, I've, I've said this many times that it was you, but I don't think it was you. <laughs> <laughs> but whoever it was, was talking about the fact that, that a lot of the time students would come and see them and would want to know, how do I figure out what God's will is for my life? Right. And I'm yeah. I'm thinking, okay, let's go. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Cause clearly working in this church, yeah, isn't working. Working, yeah. you know, and, um, and I'm just, a, I'm a practical guy. Like I've lived practically. I want to help people practically. I just, that, that's what, that's what makes sense to me. And so I listened to his podcast and he says, you know, he says, I tell everybody the same thing. Just look in your life, look where the favor of God's been and yeah. follow the favor. Yeah. And that's it. And I thought, you know what? I can do that, right? That's very logical. It's very objective. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel kind of overly spiritual and airy fairy. And so that's what we did is we sat down and said, okay, we've tried this ministry thing a couple of times and both times it's really not been very good for us as a family. It just doesn't feel like it's working. When I've been in the marketplace, life's right. been great. Like it's worked. And so, um, so we, we decided that we'd go back to the marketplace. And it was funny because I'm at the Apple store making 12 bucks an hour selling computers. Um, one day a guy walks in and I sell him a computer. He turns out to be the CEO of this security company that I ultimately end up going to work for. And I was there for five years and it was great. I mean, it, it was everything I needed to be. It helped me grow. It helped me develop. It helped introduce me to American culture um, because we'd only lived here and worked in the church bubble. So yeah, yeah. that's very different to the rest of the world. And so over the years, I've evolved that. And now I say two things, if you're wondering um, about where, where God's taking you and what he wants you to do with your life is one, yeah, look back and see where the favor is and follow the favor for sure. But two, look for the glimpses. Yeah. Um, and I talk about this concept in the book as well, this idea of a glimpse. And um, the best way I can describe it is I have found in my own life, and I don't think I'm special, so I'm sure that this happens in other people's lives as well, that God gives us glimpses of what he's placing in our hearts or what he's wanting for our lives. We just don't realize it at the time. And yeah. so I'll give you an example. When Linda and I were at Bible college, it was in a tiny little village in the middle of the countryside in England. And when I say a tiny village, I don't think there was 20 houses, maybe 25. Like there was nothing. So when you weren't studying, you could go for a walk and that was about it. And we had no vehicle. So literally you could go for a walk. So we used to walk and, and we dream, right? We're young, we just got married. 
we dream about life. We think about, you know, what, what's God going to do with us through the kingdom and everything else. But through those conversations, something that used to come up a lot was both of us had a desire to, um, to build a children's home. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense. We didn't have any money, you know, with two young kids at Bible college trying to go into ministry. But it was a thing that we would talk about fairly regularly, yeah. interesting enough, over the years. And so later on in life, when we had the opportunity to go build one, um, I look at that as a glimpse of God placing something in our heart years earlier that then came to fruition. And it's not like we prayed about it for 10 years or anything like that. You know, we forgot about it like most people do. And it was there bubbling underneath or whatever. Um, but we've seen it repeatedly. And so now I've learned to look for it. Yeah. And so even now, you know, we've got some decisions to make uh, with the house, with stuff. My business is still in Texas. I'm living in Tennessee right now. You know, that's obviously a challenge. And so again, we sit back and we say, okay, well, let's let's look at some glimpses. Let's see what we can find. What clues is God dropping in our past that are actually directional guideposts sure. for us? And we just didn't realize it at the time because if he was kind enough to drop those things there, I don't want to be naive enough to ignore them and then sit here praying, God, would you speak to me? And he sat there saying, well, dude, I did. Like, y'all just need to kind of yeah. look back and, you know, listen, you know? I think that's something the Israelites did really well. Yep. You know, they, 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 as a culture, they learned to, to memorialize their history. And I think in the West, we do it really badly. Yeah. So I, I, t I tell the kids, you know, all the time, I'm journal, just write stuff down. Like when God moves, when God does something, Pay you know, I want to have a wall of answered prayers and I don't have that right now. And I know he's answered prayers and I can think of them, but I want to see them. Like I want to document them. So that they remind Mike in the future of what God did for Mike in the past. Yep. I love it. I mean, and I, so look for favor, look where, uh, look where things are opening up for you and lean into it. Like, mm -hmm. don't hesitate, step into those opportunities. Secondly, yeah. I said, look for glimpses. And and I think you've described it two ways. One, when you did it or when, when it was in the past, it's something you've done where you sensed I was born for this or I came alive or I yeah. could do this forever. Yeah. Uh, like it, time is timeless. Uh, Ken Robertson, I think his name, wrote a book uh, same thing. He calls it, it calls it different things, but it's like right. finding your sweet spot. And then you said also, what do you always talk about? What are your dreams? What right. could you, you and your spouse or you and your friends, I could constantly talk about this. And I'm not talking about the football. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about yeah. something that's impacting lives. Yeah. Unless your football is impacting lives, maybe. So those are two really, really good things. Come back a step. Um, it was really interesting. You guys were both young, naive. It was really hard, like really hard. So my question is, uh, how do you know when, so when it's hard, is it hard because I need to push through? I'm 20. I, I just need to suck it up and actually develop some discipline because hard things actually give life meaning. And actually I need hard things to help me grow. So that's number one. The house it's been difficult. It's been hard. So how do I know when it's hard because it's like it's good, this is going to help me grow, or it's hard because this is not for me and I need to actually hit the exit button and find an off ramp and change my course or direction? How do I know the difference? Yeah. So look, I mean, I still wrestle with that now, right? I, like I don't, I don't have the the solution here. You know, I think what I would say is for us when things have felt unreasonably difficult um or challenging you know one obviously pray to get other people to pray with you uh, and talk to other people who are trusted people in your life you know we've been very blessed um to have some great people around us and not just anybody but pe people with a spiritual walk right people who are more interested in jesus than the football i mean that yeah. kind of thing and you, you're going to need those folks in life so if you don't have them you need to find hang them. On, hang on, i just love this so how do i know it's someone that's more interested in Jesus than the football. Like, there you go. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Whatever football is in your culture. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. And so then I think, look, I've definitely repeatedly in life, um, first time we were in the US when it, it wasn't working, you know, we, we went back to England. Um, second time when it wasn't working, I, I went and got work. So I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is, look for a way out yeah. and see whether it happens. 
Um, if God doesn't want you to be out, he'll, he'll make sure you're not out. Yeah. So, you know, he, he can stop that and he can close that door. I mean, don't go there straight away, but you know, if you pray through things yep. and you know, you've done everything you know how to do to make yep. something make sense and it just isn't, then look for the way out. And so, if, so yeah. here, if I clarify it, so number one, have you done everything? You, have you done everything you need to do? That's like right. a prerequisite. Yeah. Now, assuming you have number one, pray about it. Number two, pray with others. You said number three, talk to trusted people. I think that's really good. I probably, and I, and the assumption that I've got in listening to you is listen. <laughs> if all of those trusted people are saying something and you're ignoring yeah. it, the problem is you. Like there's there's an issue. Yeah. But then. I love this. Look for a way out. Test it. I mean, I think I love this entrepreneurial nature of the kingdom of God, which is yeah. test it and see. Don't. I had someone call me the other day saying, "Hey, I've got a bunch of prophetic words about this going on and this happening. Uh, could you pray about, you know, it?" And I said, "No. You have got ten prophetic words from God. Right. And you're hearing about this. It witnesses with you, and you're asking me to get more confirmation. Yeah. Shut up. Get moving." Yeah. Um, and and lean into it as in take a step towards it and then see what God does as a response to faith rather than sitting there passively faithless waiting for someone to tell you what to do. There's way too many people. And that's what I love about this, Mike, and Bob Goff recognizing, hey, here's another guy that's a kingdom explorer and adventurer recognizing there's way more of God beyond your comfort zone. So you so you've done this repeatedly, again and again and again. I think you put in a book because it's got to help this next generation. What, What's next for Mike and Linda? Well, I sure wish we'd talked a week ago because it, <laughs> it would have been a different answer. Um, apparently, um, apparently, I like adventure a little too much. So I don't, I don't have something final that I can share, yeah. but... I used to think buying a burned down house would be the craziest thing that we would do, <laughs> but I don't think it is the craziest thing we're going to do because I'm about to do something a whole lot crazier. And um, yeah, I think I think we'll know more later today or tomorrow, but um, yeah, this is going to look a little tame. So I'm trying to get my head around it. Okay. Apparently God likes to make us uncomfortable. Um, even when we think, dude, I've been stretched enough here. Like I don't, I don't need to be stressed again on some crazy whatever uh, apparently he thinks that i do so yeah and, maybe and by the time I mean, this episode comes out we'll know more yeah so i mean people can find it mike thacker.com mm -hmm. you can see that there they can follow the story grab the book um mike in all of this you've given us some great keys in terms of follow the favor look for the favor look for the glimpses of god where i was born for this or i could talk about this for hours recognize that's the way that god made you look for those wins in your life lean into those, uh, leverage wise counsel and prayer, not just praying on your own, praying with others, some real practical things. And I love it. Do something, do something, just do something, right. test it. Yeah. In all of these things, we get to follow the journey and watch others and learn from others. But in all these threads with you, there's been this theme of leaning in and listening for the voice of God. How have you learned to hear the voice of God and how do you know God speaking? Yeah, well, you know, you and I have talked about this. I know I, I got to sneak peek some of your chapters in the book and, and we had a conversation about this as well. Um, according to a very a very wise guy on this podcast, not me, um, hearing from God is easy. <laughs> so apparently I make it more difficult than it should be. We um, all do. Yeah. I don't so I don't I don't think look, I don't think I've ever heard an audible voice of God. I don't think I've Maybe. ever seen a finger writing in the sky or anything crazy like that. Uh, what I can tell you is for the few big things in life where we've really done something just ridiculous, uh, for example, when we were moving to America um, this time, we uh, we had applied for our visas and that kind of stuff. And um, actually, no, it wasn't this time. It was it was in it was the first time. So, well, if I've got a second, let me t let me flesh the story out for you. We worked with Teen Challenge in the '90s. We were a Bible college. They offered us jobs to come back to. So we applied for visas and we were denied. And so we couldn't come back. Um, but we had all our eggs in that one basket. We just didn't even comprehend why we, we wouldn't get a visa, right? Because we qualified. Like on the list, we met everything. So whatever. 
So then when we get an opportunity to come to the US a few years later, um, we tried again. And, uh, you know, we fill all the paperwork out and we, we we put it all in. So we put our house up for sale. We start selling stuff off in the house and everything. And I remember I was standing in the dining room with my dad one day and uh, we were having a rather strong conversation because it was probably three weeks or so out from when we were supposed to be coming here. Yeah, We'd sold the house. We'd sold everything in the house, but we didn't have approval on the visas. And he just thought that, I was just crazy, right? Like, you've already been denied once. What are you doing? Like, you've got nothing left, and you don't even know that you're going to get there. And I said, oh, it's going to be fine. Like, God's got it. We're supposed to be there. Um, So that that doesn't happen every time. I'm just using that as an example of of maybe a bigger step. But what I've noticed for myself is um, when we've had big steps to take, it's been nothing more than a nudge. Yeah. Just, Just some kind of random gut little kick very gentle very quiet almost so quiet that i've missed it yeah um but it doesn't go away it kind of just simmers and you know i ignore it for a week or two and think no that's just ridiculous you know and then it's there again um even here was one of them right my business is in texas why would i move to tennessee 800 miles away and um it was just there and it was just kind of just noodling along and every couple of weeks it would be in the back of my mind and so we then we start leaning into it praying about it you know yeah. and all those other kind of things and for us that's how it's been and so you know i'm not saying that's how it is for everybody but um even coming back to america i mean we literally just woke up one day and i said you know what if god isn't finished with us over there that's right you know, we've been here for two years we'd gone home we'd had two babies we were settled around family and everything but it was just this it was just this feeling of what if yeah and so You know, we just pushed on that door and, you know, here we are 20 years later. So that's how it's been for me. I mean, I love that. I I, I agree. I mean, I haven't heard the audible voice of God externally. Most commonly, it's a still small voice or most commonly it's a nudge. And then over time, it becomes proven and you can look back. Oh, that was God. I'm not that smart. Right. And and. Often I can look back and think I made it worse or harder or more difficult than it needed to be because I didn't listen or respond. Right. But you've also talked about, so follow the nudge or you said the gentle gut kick that doesn't go away, which is Jeremiah says, your word is like a fire in my bones. I grow weary of holding it in or as in, I can't ignore it. I just, it just, it stays there. And I love it that you're talking to your spouse about it. I love it that you have wise counsel uh, and I love it. You just take steps and, and you keep moving forward and then a life proves it. And I can't wait to see what happens next. Mike, if people want to find out more about you, follow along the story, how can they listen up? How can they follow? How can they see what you're up to? Uh, I mean, the website, just mikethacker.com or I guess Instagram at real Mike Thacker. That's probably the two best places to go. Man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much.